Welcome back. In this lecture, we'll be talking about the macroscopic anatomy of the human nervous system. And by macroscopic, I mean things that we can generally see without a microscope. And then in the next chapter, chapter three, we'll begin to talk about um, uh, more microscopic things at the cellular level. So to begin with, we'll have a general overview of the function and structure of the human nervous system, and we'll get into the development and introduce the, the general overview of the structure, and then talk about the somatic and autonomic nervous systems as well. So our brain's primary function in the world is to produce our behavior, as we spoke about last lecture. And by behavior, we mean movement throughout the world. So to do that, we have to receive all the sensory information about our environment. We have to integrate together the various information, whether it's our vision or hearing about the world, to create a subjective perception of the world. And we have to use that perception to produce the appropriate commands to move our muscles to act appropriately. So the, as we recall from last chapter, the organization of the nervous system is into the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. So the central nervous system is the brain and the spinal cord, and then all the other processes that radiate out from there are we call the peripheral nervous system. Okay, so we can see that in this anatomical organizational chart, we have the central nervous system comprising the brain and spinal cord and the peripheral nervous system, which we'll talk about today as well, um, containing the somatic, the autonomic, and the enteric nervous systems in our gut. So the peripheral nervous system carries the sensory information from our peripheral parts of our body and limbs and face into the central nervous system. And also the peripheral nerves carry information from our central nervous system back to our muscles and to our organs. We can think about this organization functionally as well. So the nervous system is divided into the central nervous system, the somatic, autonomic, and enteric which all we saw are comprising the peripheral nervous system. The uh, somatic nervous system controls all our movements and transmits all our sensory information. And the autonomic nervous system controls our internal organs and functions. And so the autonomic nervous system is further divided into the sympathetic and parasympathetic divisions, which we'll talk about later in this lecture. And finally, the enteric nervous system controls our gut and receives information from our gut about the state of our digestion. Okay, so the CNS and the PNS, these three parts of the peripheral nervous system, together constitute this four-part system. The brain and spinal cord, the somatic nervous system, which carries all this information to and from our body. And then, as we said, the autonomic nervous system, which prepares us to either rest and digest and calms us via the parasympathetic connections, or prepares us to fight or, or run away using the sympathetic arousing nerves controlling our organs. And then the enteric nervous system, this mesh that lines our gut and communicates to our central nervous system what our state of our metabolism. So as we see, information flows in two directions. Information flows from the outside world is, is uh, admitted into our nervous system and we call these connections afferent. So A for admit or afferent. And information also leaves our central nervous system and is transmitted out to our body. And this exits or is efferent, leaving our nervous system. So when we step on attack, the incoming information comes up is in the afferent pathway into our spine and central nervous system. And then the efferent information comes down out of the central nervous system to control our muscles and move them. Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit about the anatomical and directional terminology that we're gonna use in this class to talk about the locations and, and parts of the body. So we use the often the body parts location with respect to other parts of the human or the animal. We talk about things with respect to relative locations like the mid center of the body and also from the perspective of the viewer as we'll see. 
So on the brain body orientation, we can think about the reference frame as being with respect to our face. And so we can talk about the anterior section of the brain closer to the front or the posterior section of the brain closer to the back. We can talk about the lateral section towards our ears or the medial section towards the center of our head. We can talk about the ventral and the dorsal extent of our brain as well in these directions. We can also slice through the brain, either virtually with our uh, MRI technology, or alternatively we can, in, uh, after someone's passed away, we can do a dissection of their brain and we can take different cuts, which have different terms. There's a coronal section of the brain of which we can view from the front. There is a horizontal section of the brain of which we can view from the dorsal side and a sagittal section of the brain we can view from the medial side. Notice you can view these from the other side as well. So you can have a coronal section and have a posterior view from the back. Uh, but because it's a slice, you would see the same thing. Uh, but notice these three orientations, coronal, horizontal, and sagittal. And a mid-sagittal cut is one we see quite often that divides straight down the middle of our heads like this. Our brain is protected by a, a series of layers of tissue called meninges, as well as our outer skull. And the meninges protect the inside brain. The most outer layer of meninges is called the dura mater, or the hard mother in Latin. It's a tough, fibrous tissue. Inside that is something called the arachnoid layer, which has a more delicate connective tissue with some holes inside. And Finally, wrapped around the brain itself is something called the pia matter or the soft mother. And this clings to the surface of the brain. So if you look in this cartoon, you can see the brain itself, the pia matter clinging to the surface, the arachnoid membrane on top of that with a cavity called the subarachnoid space, which is filled with this fluid we'll talk about in a moment, which encases the brain. Finally, the dura matter and then the skull and the scalp. Okay, so the cerebral cortex itself is this thin sheet of nerves. It's not this dense organ that's full of nerves. It's actually a thin layer of nerves that's folded in and amongst itself to fit inside the skull. And we can use our, our, our fist like this. Oops, it's hard to get it on the camera. Our fist like this as a general, um, orientation of, of the parts of the brain, as we see in this diagram, um, so that the, the thumb is the temporal lobe, the front of the finger is the frontal lobe, the knuckle is the parietal lobe, and the wrist is the occipital lobe. So these are the roughly the, the lobes of the brain, which we'll talk about next, and their orientation in the, inside the head. And so each of these lobes of the brain is, uh, has many subregions inside it, but has a general um, role in our cognition and behavior. The frontal lobe is involved in our executive functions like planning. The parietal lobe is involved in integrating sensory information together. The temporal lobe is involved in our um, audition and our taste and smell as well has important roles in our memory. And the occipital lobe is uh, involved in our vision. And we'll talk about these in more detail throughout the class. On the very surface of the brain, we can see that there's bumps and grooves. The bumps are called gyri or gyruses. Each one is a gyrus. These are small protrusions of cortex. The sulci are the bumps, each one called a sulcus, or sorry, are the grooves inside the brain, the valleys. And a fissure is a very deep sulcus that divides very large parts of the cortex. So here we can see four different views of the brain, a dorsal view, a ventral view of the underside, a, a medial view and a midline view. We can see these various um, parts of the brain, both in the cartoon and in the real drawing. We had a question on E-class about the difficulty of finding the central sulcus, which you can see here 
in a real brain compared to the cartoon brain with the shading that the gyri and sulci are much more random and identifying these sulci and fissures is a little bit more difficult. Okay, on the bottom, we see this mid-sagittal view. We're on the inside of the brain. You can see many of these other features, which we'll talk about throughout the class today and throughout the rest of the semester. Two major features that we can see for the first time here are the longitudinal fissure, which separates the left and right hemisphere of the brain, as well as the lateral fissure, which separates the temporal lobe and the frontal lobe. Finally, the central sulcus is the third biggest sulcus uh, in the human brain, which is separating the frontal and parietal lobes as per the question on E-class. So the cerebrum and the cerebellum are two parts of our brain that we can see from the outside surface. The cerebrum is this major forebrain structure of wrinkly brain that we see on the outside with the left and right hemisphere. The cerebellum is this little brain, uh, this wrinkly brain that we see down back here below our occipital lobe that's more uh, evolutionarily ancient and is involved in coordination of motor and other mental processes. The brain stem, you can see in these diagrams, I'll go back to you can see the brain stem hanging out on this dorsal view of the brain or in the middle of this mid sagittal view, which comes and connects down to the spinal cord. The brain stem includes the hindbrain, midbrain, thalamus, and hypothalamus. And this is responsible for a lot of the unconscious behaviors that we do every day that we don't think about. Our brain is just like the rest of our body, um, supplied with blood from our lungs filled with oxygen and nutrients. And this blood flows into our brain through three major blood vessels or arteries, the anterior, middle, and posterior. Uh, and so a uh, stroke is the sudden appearance of symptoms following an interruption of blood flow through one of these arteries. And a stroke on the left side of the brain will affect activity on the right side of the body and vice versa. A stroke is a very uh, common injury that occurs um, very often and uh, needs quick treatment. And so you should learn the signs of a stroke. The three different arteries um, supply blood to the brain in this pattern. And so you can get selective damage after a stroke to one of these uh, parts of the brain and not the other two. You can also get it uh, unilaterally, you can see you can unilateral stroke that blocks the middle cerebral artery on one side. So stroke is the second leading cause of death worldwide. And eight out of 10 people that have a stroke survive, but they have a diminished quality of life after. There's two types of stroke, ischemic, ischemic and hemorrhagic stroke and they differ in um, their type. Ischemic stroke is a blockade of the blood and hemorrhagic stroke is a bleed out into the brain. A hemorrhagic stroke is much more dangerous and because the blood acts like a poison and damages the blood, the tissue of the brain. An ischemic stroke can be treated using a clockbuster drug. And so one of the priorities of neuroscience research right now is to try to better understand how we can quickly identify ischemic strokes and treat them as fast as possible. If you look in at the cut piece of human brain, you'll see different types of tissue by the color. You'll see gray tissue and white tissue. The gray tissue around the outside of the human brain is called gray matter composed predominantly of the neuron cells. The white matter is composed predominantly of axons that connect these neurons together. The corpus callosum is this large connection between the two hemispheres of axons that therefore appears white in these images. Okay, so here we can see a slice through the brain where we see it's not just this homogeneous group of neurons, but it has this 
tree-like structure where the outside bark contains this gray area full of neurons and the inner areas contain all these white axons connecting them together. You can see this both on an image of a, of a dissected brain and on the cartoon. And you can see this large corpus callosum of axons connecting the two hemispheres together in this coronal view. Also in these views, you see holes in the brain called ventricles. And these holes uh, are filled with this cerebral spinal fluid that also uh, fills up that subarachnoid space on the outside of our brain. We have these two lateral ventricles like horns through the inside of our brain. And then we have the third and fourth ventricles which travel down the brain stem towards the spinal cord. These make a continuous space with that subarachnoid space and the fluid is continuous throughout that space and cushions the brain. Cerebral spinal fluid is composed of salts and it fills up these ventricles and the subarachnoid space and cushions the brain like a nice bath. And our brain is constantly producing this cerebral spinal fluid and it's being um, leaked out through the, the veins in the subarachnoid space. And we make about one fifth of the needed supply every hour. So it's constantly being reproduced to, to beat our brain. We can get an infection of these meninges and the cerebral spinal fluid, which is called meningitis. And it's, uh, the primary symptoms of onset are this very stiff neck and headache. Here's a nice picture of the ventricles uh, see through, uh, seen through a brain. You can see the shape of these third ventricles. Inside them would be the thalamus and in between the two sections of the thalamus would be this third ventricle traveling down to a fourth ventricle down the brain stem. And the corpus callosum we've already mentioned is this band of white matter that connects the two hemispheres together, it has about 200 million axons connecting the left and right hemisphere. And in general, one area on the right hemisphere will connect to the analogous corresponding area on the left hemisphere through this pathway. When we zoom in further, we see that the brain's composed both of neurons, of which there are about 80 billion, which carry about all these functions we're talking about, but also glia cells, which aid and support these activities, of which there are even more. And these glia cells and neurons come in different types, which we'll talk about in the next chapter. Um, but at a very most surface level, the neurons have these cell bodies and large dendrites and axons. The glia generally, um, like this astrocyte, don't have the same linear connection um, as the neurons. So um, an axon is a connection between two neurons. A nerve is a large connection of the, those axons that course together outside of the central nervous system. Whereas a tract is a large connection of axons that course together within the central nervous system. So a cell body, an axon, a second neuron, and together as a group, they can combine to form these nerves or tracts, depending on if they're inside or outside. And we can use certain stains in our microscope images to identify different aspects of the anatomy. So one particular stain can identify the cell bodies in the gray matter. You can see here, they're clustered together. These fine little blue dots where each one of them is a neuron. Here, for instance, is the hippocampus, this dark, dark band of, of black showing tons of cells there. Alternatively, you can stain with something else that will um, exaggerate the white matter tracks here shown on the right. So now we can see that the opposite areas of the brain are dark and it's all these white matter connections between the various cortical areas and also these subcortical areas. Nuclei are groups of cells that form together into a cluster. So these subcortical nuclei, which we'll talk about are groups of neurons, instead of in a, a sheet, they're 
kind of a, a, t and a little circle together. Next, we'll talk about the development of the nervous system. Starting um, in the embryo all the way up to um, our uh, full human brain and how these relate to other brains in the animal kingdom. So our human brain has retained many of the features of less complex mammalian and other animal brains. And most of the behaviors that we produce, like looking around the world or walking around and grabbing something, are actually the kind of a, a layering of these more complex brain regions on top of more basic, simple regions from our evolutionary past. So we share in common with the adult brain of a fish, amphibian, or reptile, a stage in the development of our brain and the embryo in which our brain has three parts called a prosencephalon, the front brain, meson, and rhombencephalon, front, middle, and hind brain. And in these animals, the prosencephalon is responsible for the sense of smell, the mesencephalon is responsible for vision and hearing, and the rhombencephalon controls their movement and balance, the spinal cord being part of that rhombencephalon. In mammals, two of these areas have further developed. The prosencephalon develops to form the diencephalon, the between brain structures that contain the thalamus and hypothalamus, and the telencephalon, the cerebral cortex itself. And the hind brain further develops into the metencephalon and the myelencephalon. So the metencephalon being the cerebellum and the myelencephalon being the spinal cord. So we start off in this state as the prosencephalon, mesencephalon, and rhombencephalon. And rhombencephalon differentiates into metan and myelencephalon. Prosencephalon differentiates into telon and dialencephalon. And these develop into the adult human brain. Um, the way I recall the order from the telencephalon down to the spinal cord is that they're after telencephalon, they're in alphabetical order. So dian mesen, metan, and myelencephalon are in alphabetical order, with telencephalon at the top. We'll talk a little bit about the development of the nervous system throughout the course, but we're gonna skip the chapter specifically about nervous system development. You can go on and take other courses at the university specifically about these topics. Now we're gonna go into detail about the central nervous system and its parts. These are gonna be generally an overview of each of the parts. And then in subsequent chapters of the class, we're gonna um, talk in more detail about these areas. So the central nervous system has three major components, the spinal cord, brain stem, and forebrain, which we'll talk about in turn. The spinal cord controls our body's movements and our spinal cord can act independently of the brain. We have, for instance, spinal reflexes or automatic movements that are hard to inhibit. So for instance, you can get um, uh, the under your patella of your kneecap hit with a rubber mallet and your quadricep muscle will, um, will tighten and your leg will swing out. And this is a, a, a reflex that involves just your spinal cord and not the rest of your brain. The brain stem begins where the spinal cord connects to the skull and the brain stem receives afferent nerves from the senses around in our face, like our eyes and nose, and it sends efferent nerves out to control our movements. The brain stem has three regions, the hindbrain, midbrain, and diencephalon, and the diencephalon uh, has been further developed as we've evolved into humans. So you can think about the brain stem like your upright fist, whereas the wrist is this midbrain, the fist itself is the diencephalon, and the forearm is the hindbrain, where the cerebellum and the pons are. So we're going to talk about each of these structures in turn, the cerebellum and the midbrain and the diencephalon. <clears throat> 
So our hindbrain is the evolutionarily oldest part of our brain. It contains the cerebellum, an area called the reticular formation, the pons, and the medulla. These control various of our simple motor functions, functions like um, breathing and fine movements. So we integrate together in this area voluntary and involuntary bodily movements and send those systems, those commands down to the body. The cerebellum controls complex movements and cognitive functions. And we'll talk in more detail in the chapters on movement about the cerebellum. The size of the cerebellum increases across the animal kingdom, depending on the speed and complexity of movements of the animals. The cerebellum contains both subcortical structures and a gray and white matter area, much like our cortex. The reticular activating system is a, a group of different neurons and nerve fibers that are going up and down throughout the brainstem, which stimulate the forebrain, for instance, in our sleep wakes and arousal cycles. The pons is a, a structure just anterior to the cerebellum, which connects the cerebellum with the rest of our body and controls important movements. And the medulla is on the most rostral tip of the spinal cord. So that means it's at the very, the tip closest to the, the head. And it controls things like breathing and our heart rate. And a blow to the head can damage the medulla and cause you um, to become uh, unconscious if this area is impacted. And also many of the dangerous drugs um, that people overdose on are, these overdoses are caused by inhibition of regions of the medulla. So here are those structures again, the reticular formation is these hot dog-like structures in the cartoon, which are actually small groups of neurons and their axons going up and down here and up to the cortex. The pons you can see connects on either side to the cerebellum. The cerebellum here is on the back side, and then the, the medulla are these structures down at the very bottom of the brainstem, controlling things like our breathing. If we look a little higher in the tectum or the wrist of that model, we have, uh, sorry, in the midbrain, we have the tectum and the tegmentum. The tectum on the back side on the roof, and the tegmentum on the floor closest to our throat. The tectum is involved in sensory processing. It takes in information from the superior and inferior, uh, sorry, from visual and auditory pathways in areas called the superior and inferior colliculi. And this is involved in producing orienting movements. So when you hear a loud sound and you turn to hear where it came from, this is involving these very evolutionarily ancient circuits that we share in common with frogs. The tegmentum, um, and so the, uh, more anterior to those areas, closer to our throat, controls things like our limb and eye movements through some uh, nuclei clusters of neurons, controls species-specific behaviors, and also our perception of pain through an area that lines um, the ventricle called the paraqueductal gray. We'll talk about these in more detail here on the next slide. So here's a slice through the midbrain here. And with the tectum on one side and the tegmentum on the other. So you can see in that slice that you have here the superior colliculi, which are receiving information uh, from the sensory systems that are just above the inferior colliculi. And then inside the midbrain, you have these various areas of substantia nigra, which is involved with dopamine and our movement the red nucleus, which is involved in gating our movement, and the reticular formation, which we've already talked about, and the cerebral aqueduct, which is this small cavity of cerebral spinal fluid, is surrounded by this area called the paraqueductal gray. So these are a lot of color words. The paraqueductal gray, substantia nigra, saying that it appears kind of black, and the red nucleus, because it appears kind of red in these stains. If we move up further to the diencephalon, we've come to the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The diencephalon integrates our sensory and motor information on the way out to the cerebral cortex. And the hypothalamus is involved in a lot of our um, 
behavior as well through our hormones. The hypothalamus regulates our temperature, our eating, our drinking, our sexual behavior, and it's composed of many different nuclei of groups of neurons. The thalamus is similarly composed of different groups of neurons into nuclei, and it's kind of a relay station for sensory information coming from, for instance, the visual or auditory systems to come into the thalamus or moving on to the cortex. And a lot of this sensory information may be integrated together in this region as well. The hypothalamus controls our hormones through its connection to the pituitary gland just underneath it, the pituitary gland connecting into our blood system. When I just got thirsty for that drink of water, that was my hypothalamus signaling that my salt levels or my water levels in my blood weren't appropriate, and then I should change my state. Involved also in telling you when you need to go to sleep or wake up, and you're in your temperature in your temperature regulation as well. You can go on and take whole classes about uh, hormones and behavior uh, in our department. The thalamus is a more sensory organ involved in channeling information as it comes in from our body and our, our sensory organs uh, into the brain. Two of the areas we'll talk, or three of the areas we'll talk about today are the lateral, the medial, geniculate nuclei. These take in information from the visual and auditory systems respectively, and we'll visit them again in those chapters. The dorsal medial nucleus does the same thing, but for our uh, smell information from our nose. So the thalamus seems to be both like a switchboard operator connecting the sensory information through to where it needs to go, but also a way of integrating the various senses together. Finally, up to the forebrain. So the forebrain contains our neocortex, this wrinkly outer cortex itself, which regulates our mental activities and our behavior. As well, it contains the basal ganglia, a series of nuclei inside the brain, so subcortical, which control our movement, and the limbic system, a group of structures that controls our emotions and our memories. And again, these are just an introduction to these various systems, and we'll talk about them again, the limbic system, for example, in the chapter on memory, the basal ganglia, and the chapter on movement. So, this will just at first be a very surface introduction to these um, a surface introduction to these structures. So the forebrain, this outer cortex, integrates our sensory emotion and memory information together. It involves in our th things like thinking, planning, and language. When you got up and made your breakfast and planned what you're going to have, this was involving your forebrain. The cerebral cortex itself is actually divided into two parts. The neocortex is the newest part, which has six layers. And the allocortex, which is evolutionarily older, it has three or four layers and controls more ancient things like our motivational states and memory. Our neocortex itself has a surface area about the size of a newspaper. If you open up the newspaper and you lay it out like this, but it's been wrinkled down to fit inside the cavity of our, of our skull. But, and it's only about three millimeters thick, that newspaper, and the rest inside there is all these axons. Uh, in contrast, a chimpanzee only has this, a brain the size of about one page of, of or sorry, a quarter of that newspaper. Our forebrain, as we saw, is divided into these four lobes, the occipital being involved in vision, parietal being involved in tactile functions and other sensory domains, the temporal being involved in memory and visual and auditory functions, and the frontal lobe being involved in motor and executive functions. Here we see again the four lobes and the division into the left and right hemisphere. We see the longitudinal fissure and the lateral fissure, as well as the central sulcus. We still see the brain stem and the cerebellum from lower in the brain. This newspaper-like cortex, the outer cerebral cortex, is actually even though it's only two millimeters thick, it's divided into six layers of cells. 
And these six layers of cells differ throughout the brain. So the occipital layers might look different from the motor layers and the frontal layers. And even within the visual cortex, different areas might look slightly different. And these differences in structure seem to be related to differences in function, as we'll see. So over 100 years ago, someone created what was called a cytoarchitectonic map by looking at each of these structures in a microscope and identifying how, where unique boundaries were between areas. At a gross level, we can see if we compare the motor and the sensory cortex on either side of the central sulcus, that the width, the, the size of the various layers differs. It seems that um, the output layers of the motor cortex, or layers five and six, are much larger in the motor cortex than they are in the sensory cortex, whereas the incoming information, the input layer four, is much larger in the sensory cortex than it is in the motor cortex as would be expected just based on what these regions do. This one has to output a lot of information. This one has to receive a lot of information. And so throughout the brain, these differences continue to obtain such that a map like this can be made where various brain regions are identified just by how they look under a microscope. And since then we've gone on based off studies, both of people getting lesions to these areas and also studies of MRI brain activation showing where people have increased blood flow when they do certain tasks to confirm the functional relevance of these various areas and that they do one thing and not other things. Uh, in color here, it's shown where the primary visual information is, primary auditory and primary somatosensory information from our skin enters into the brain. The basal ganglia are a collection of nuclei just below this white matter. And they will be talked about again in the motor chapter, but they're composed mainly of three structures called the caudate nucleus, the putamen, and the globus pallidus, or the pale globe. Uh, it controls our voluntary and involuntary movement. And disorders like Parkinson's and Tourette's syndrome are uh, breakdowns of the basal ganglia. Parkinson's being uh, increased activity of the basal ganglia, which clamps our behavior and doesn't allow behavior through. And Tourette's being, uh, one could think of as the opposite, uh, not as much clamping of behavior and letting too much behavior through. So here we can see two views of the bas basal ganglia. They look a lot like over the ear headphones with the wrap around that goes behind your ear and then a part that comes out towards the front where the hippocampus and amygdala are. Here you can see the globus pallidus and the caudate. Caudate means tail. So you can see this tail-like structure. Um, here you can see in a sagittal view, the caudate and the globus pallidus here and the putamen on the outside. So you can see that um, in slices, these structures look kind of unconnected, but in a three-dimensional view, you can see they're kind of a large organ distributed in space in the brain. We see that they also take in information from all the motor areas of the brain, and send information out to the body, and they decide which motor information goes out to the body. The limbic system is a bunch of nearby and connected structures to the basal ganglia that are involved in um, regulation of our emotion and our memory and our spatial navigation. The principal structures we'll talk about today are the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the cingulate cortex. So the cingulate cortex is this very ancient part of our cortex that we would touch if we stuck our fingers down through that longitudinal fissure and felt the inside surface of the cortex before we, our fingers hit the corpus callosum we would feel this smooth part of cortex there called the cingulate. It's an ancient allo cortex in that it only has four layers. It seems to be involved in uh, regulating our emotions and motivations and our behaviors. Here underneath are the amygdala and hippocampus, closely associated structures involved in our memory, the hippocampus, and, our, and the amygdala is involved in our fear and anxiety. 
we'll talk more about those structures throughout the class. Okay, finally, we're going to talk about the somatic and autonomic nervous systems to finish off this lecture. The somatic nervous system transmits information to and from our body, to and from our central nervous system. It involves the cranial nerves controlled by the brain and the spinal nerves controlled by the spinal cord segments. It emits information through its afferent functions from the eyes, ears, mouth, and nose and skin, and it emits information through its efferent connections to muscles and tongues and eyes and organs. Or sorry, not organs. This is the cranial nerve. So just the muscles of the tongues and eyes. So both functions. Oh, and some of the cranial nerves also do both things. So some of the cranial nerves will also both pick up information from sensory world and send information to control movement. There's actually 12 different nerves coming off of different parts of our brain and brain stem, which we'll learn about in more detail throughout this class. Um, for now, you can just see that there are 12 different ones. Some of them are transmitting motor information. Some of them are picking up sensory information and some are doing both. You can see the vagus nerve controlling our organs, that, which comes out of our brain stem and the olfactory nerve here one um, which has an olfactory bulb at the top of our nose, which connects uh, into the brain through that um, direction. For now, you likely won't have to learn all of them and what they do uh, to be able to recreate this list on an exam, for instance, since you just have multiple choice questions. But if you take upper level courses, you'll come to memorize these cranial nerves. If we look down into our spinal cord, we see that each of the nerves that exits and enters our spinal cord controls a certain segment of our body called the dermatome. So this is the area of our skin where all the sensory receptors all enter into one section of our spinal cord. Each of our spinal cord segments are interconnected so they can operate together to coordinate movement. For instance, if I bend over, a bunch of my different spinal cord segments are all going to be active. So here's a map of our spinal cord showing each of the vertebrae and spinal cord segments. And we can see that each of those spinal cord segments receives sensory information from a certain map portion of the, of the body. And so for instance, the, um, your heel here receives or transmits the sensory information when you tickle the back of your heel up into your L5 segment of your spinal cord. And so when you get damage to a particular incoming sensory information into the spinal cord, you can get spurious pain felt in parts of your body, uh, which is what I'm experiencing right now. I uh, have pinching in here of the incoming L4 and L5 and S1 nerves, and I have pain radiating down into my calves and thighs and legs. And I'm going for an MRI on the 20th to image this section of my spinal cord to look if um, there's any impingement on these neurons when they exit or enter the spinal cord segment. Actually, because my doctor gave me that spinal cord reflex um, back on, my family doctor gave me this test amongst me telling her my pain and found that my reflex was slow. So as the information went up into my spinal cord and came back down to move my quadricep muscle, that pathway was relatively slow compared to other people giving her some indication that there's some damage again up here in the spinal cord segment where that incoming sensory information from the, from the tendon uh, has to activate the outgoing motor information to move the leg. Okay, so here's the spinal cord segment. We see the incoming sensory information coming into the back area, the dorsal area. All these are carrying information from our skin and muscles. They get together in a group where their cell bodies are called the posterior root. And this is one area where um, 
your discs can push and can create this spurious nerve pain. Um, the, in the ventral areas, nerves exit and get sent out to our muscles to move them. And you can see that these incoming and outgoing connections are neurons connect together, which is where these reflexes would happen. Not just that though, but information from sensory um, parts of the body goes up to the central nervous system and incoming information from the central, or sorry, outgoing information from the central nervous system, afferent activity can go down to control the muscles through these pathways. We'll cover this again in the sections on movement, um, how uh, damage to the spinal cord therefore can affect um, certain parts of the body. Finally, the autonomic and enteric nervous systems. The autonomic system balances all of our internal organs. It's kind of a teeter-totter between the sympathetic system, which arouses us and gets us ready for things like giving a lecture, and the parasympathetic system, which relaxes us and allows us to digest and relax. You can see that each of these systems uh, interacts with all our internal organs through different pathways. The sympathetic pathways generally leave through our thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. And as they uh, send out the information um, through the efferent connections in the ventral part of those pathways, they go through these um, intermediary areas on the way to the target organ. And so for instance, this will inhibit our digestion if you're in the middle of a sports match. And then once the game is over and you get home and sit down on the couch, the vagus nerve will become activated and that will stimulate your digestion and make you hungry or make you eat the food that's in your, make you digest the food that's in your stomach. Here's another simple one that you can relate to where when you uh, think about the upcoming midterm exam, your heart rate might accelerate. And then when you remember that it's open book and that you can work with a friend, you have, might have this inhibition by the vagus nerve that will slow your heart rate. In general, these responses are thought to be unconscious, but as we know, we can control these things through things like breathing or meditation, um, or even just being nervous. So our psychology can influence the function of our internal organs through these pathways. Finally, the enteric nervous system um, controls the gut. The enteric nervous system is a network of neurons embedded in our gastrointestinal lining. It controls the functioning of our bowels, secretions into our linings, the blood flow and the nutrient absorption. And so you can think about this also giving signals up to our central nervous system about the nutrients and about our hunger. And these connect extensively through the autonomic nervous system, especially via the vagus nerve. And there's a growing amount of evidence showing that in many behavioral disorders like stress or anxiety, um, we can have modifications of the function of the gut. So before a stressful exam, you might have a upset stomach. So there's this interaction between activity in the gut and interaction in our central nervous system. Um, and there's even indication that um, microorganisms of our gut can influence our mental health and well being. So, that certain types of microorganisms living in our stomach might uh, influence our, our brain state and mental health. Okay, so that's the material for this chapter. We talked about the general overview of the brain. We talked very briefly about all these different structures of the most complicated organism. Or, complicated organ in, in the universe. And so it will be slow and, and we just touch the surface of each of these parts. And from my experience, when you just touch the surface, it's quite difficult to remember the various things without this uh, complex other group of information about what they do or what happens when they get broken. Um, so hopefully this kind of scaffolding that we've learned today can get filled in throughout the year and throughout your future classes at the university as you learn more about these areas and systems.
Thanks very much.